Hello, welcome to our discussion on Chapter 2 in Chem 101. Uh, we're going to be discussing how to relate uh, the world around us to things at the very small level, on the level of atoms or molecules in this chapter. We'll learn how to use the periodic table to relate to these types of atoms that make up everything around us. It's the everything building block, what makes up every bit of matter in the world and in the rest of the universe. Uh, hopefully you'll start to learn to relate the periodic table to things that you see around you like the diamond and the diamond ring and then realize that relates back to all the carbon atoms present in that diamond. In fact there can be several different forms of an element. Different forms of an element are called allotropes. So carbon has several stable forms. For example, carbon can be present as graphite or diamond or fullerenes, also called buckyballs. Okay. With respect to those different forms of carbon, we say those are different allotropes of carbon. Well, in this chapter, we want to start to get a feel and a mental image as to what the very smallest components of matter are that we would be interested in in a chemistry class. So we'll be looking at that. We'll be learning how to read the periodic table as well. So first of all, what we'll begin with is describing what chemistry is. We'll cover a few definitions so we're all speaking kind of the same language as we discuss chemistry. Uh, we'll look at some of the uh, ancient theories about atoms and how that led to more modern theories in the current viewpoint of the atom, including looking at the subatomic particles that are present in an atom and how that relates to our periodic table when we write symbols for atoms, isotopes, ions. So that's what we're going to be looking at here in today's lecture in the next lecture as well. So if I define what chemistry is, well chemistry is really concerned with the properties of matter as well as how matter can change from one form to another. We also will study how matter can interact with energy or how energy interacts with the matter. Okay, so we're looking at matter and energy interacting with one another, but matter must always be involved when I'm describing something as a chemical process. Okay, so in this course we'll be looking at some physical changes where the identity of our matter does not change identity, uh, but may be interacting with other substances or interacting with energy, but the identities don't change. So this could be uh, physical changes like melting of ice or water going to steam. Uh, there we have water molecules throughout. Okay, so we'll look at some of those types of physical changes. We'll also be looking at chemical changes where the identity of the substance of the matter may change as we start to rearrange the smallest component, those atoms we've been talking about. Okay, now I want you to realize that in order to really visualize this, we need to define what matter is. What is matter? It's anything that takes up space and has mass. Okay, so that's going to be the table in front of you. That's going to be your chair, your body, the air around us, uh, the rocks outside, the water you drink. Okay, all of that is matter. It takes up space and has mass. Okay, so what would we define as not matter? Well, that could be forms of energy, like electromagnetic radiation. However, in this class, we're very interested in how matter interacts with energy. We're going to be looking at how we can have heat energy being transferred in or out of a chemical reaction. In fact, a chemical reaction that releases heat energy to the surrounding. So when we have a chemical reaction and excess energy in the form of heat's release to the surrounding area, we're going to go ahead and say that's an exothermic chemical reaction when heat's released. If I have heat energy absorbed by a chemical reaction, uh, it would cool down the surroundings in an endothermic process. Okay, We can see both of those in chemical reactions in this class, so you'll have a chance to observe those. In lab, pay special attention. If your flask or beaker is heating up uh, from a chemical reaction, an exothermic process is likely what has happened. Okay, so that's what you're looking at. We'll also learn later how to predict how electromagnetic radiation, including light and other forms of electromagnetic radiation, uh, can interact with matter as it's absorbed or emitted by the matter we're looking at. And so we'll be studying that in this course. So that's related to chemistry. Okay, we're looking at changes in matter as well as how matter might be involved with energy changes as long as matter is there as part of the process. That's what we're looking at in chemistry. Really exciting things there. That's a pretty broad part of the world around us. Understanding chemistry will help you understand why things are happening all around you all of the time with the matter that makes up this world and makes up your body and makes up the biology and the biological molecules within you. It all relates to this chemistry and these changes in the matter and the molecules and the atoms that we have going on. Very exciting things.
So first of all, if I want to study matter, I have to understand that the simplest forms of matter are going to be elements. These are substances that cannot be separated into any other simpler substances by chemical means. Okay, I can combine multiple elements together to form more complex substances, and we could separate those by chemical means back into their elements. But once I have an element, I can't use a chemical reaction to make it anything simpler. I could have a nuclear process that could potentially break it down into uh, subatomic particles, but then I no longer have uh, that same element set of atoms. Okay, But that's a nuclear process, not a chemical reaction, or not a chemical change. We'll, discu we'll discuss nuclear processes a little later in the course, but right now we're going to focus on chemical reactions. Now the various smallest component of an element that we can have, and your periodic table is a nice list of all the different elements that are the building blocks that make up everything around us, but this very smallest component of an element that we can have, we currently call atoms. Now this originates from many thousands of years ago back to the ancient Greeks. So if we consider the uh, Greek philosopher Democritus in 460 BC, he postulated that all things are composed of tiny, indivisible, and indestructible particles. Now he called these atomos. That was Greek for indivisible, meaning you couldn't divide them up into anything simpler or smaller. And that really originates from his thought experiment. He didn't actually collect data that showed there were these tiny little particles making up everything around us, all the matter around us. He thought to himself, though, in a thought experiment, what if I had a substance that started breaking up into smaller pieces? Imagine you have a gold bar. Cut the gold bar in half, okay, and then take that half. Cut that half of the gold bar in half again, so I have a quarter of the gold bar. Cut it in half, I get an eighth, then I cut it in half, and it's a sixteenth. Okay, I keep cutting it up in half and half and half and half until I get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And what Democritus thought to himself in his thought experiment was he suggested that once you got to the smallest piece of matter that you could have, it no longer would be divisible. You couldn't cut it into anything smaller. So he said it was indivisible or atomos. So that's what he was suggesting. So these very smallest components of matter, we now name atoms. Now we know there's actually smaller components of matter than atoms, but they lose the identity of the elements they are once we go to subatomic particles. They no longer have the same chemical properties of the elements they originated from once I break up an atom into its subatomic particles. Uh, but realize we can really thank Democritus for this initial thought experiment. His ideas, however, were not accepted for over 2,000 years. Okay. Uh, he, he had some competition in ancient uh, Greek philosophy, and so most people didn't accept his ideas until we came back with some experimental evidence and suggested that there were very small components of elements called atoms out there. Okay, So we'll come back to that in a second. Let's consider the elements that we know of. Well, the simplest unit of an element is an atom. We can't break down atoms into anything uh, smaller in a chemical reaction. However, we do know there are subatomic particles present. Okay, and nuclear processes can break up atoms. Okay, uh, what we do know is on Earth there's 83 elements that occur naturally. Some examples of these would be gold, aluminum, lead, oxygen, carbon. Those are all elements that occur naturally all around us in the world. There's over 36 different elements out there that are created by scientists. Now, some of them are present in small quantities on Earth, but they're such small amounts that scientists have to produce more of them. Some examples of these elements created in laboratories by scientists are technetium. Now, there's some uh, isotopes of technetium that are used in medicine, for example, for uh, bone imaging, some bone scans types of techniques. Uh, americinium, uh, some isotopes of americinium are used in... Uh, different smoke detectors in order to determine when you have uh, particulate smoke particles present. So there's some type that have americinium present. Uh, other elements created by scientists like seaborgium and there's, like I said, there's over 36 different elements produced uh, by scientists in laboratories. A lot of times these elements can be quite unstable. They tend to decompose through nuclear decay processes. Okay. We'll look more at nuclear decay processes and nuclear processes later on in the course. We're going to focus on chemical reactions though right now. Uh, so let's consider some elements and their symbols. So I would like you to learn by the end of this course all of the element names and symbols on the periodic table that we discuss.
Okay, so I would like you to begin learning the first 36 elements and symbols on the periodic table, and there's a nice handout on Blackboard under the Useful Handout tab with common element names and symbols I would like you to learn. Yes, there are some beyond the first 36 on that handout. Begin learning those as soon as possible. Aim to learn those before the end of this week. Okay and work on learning those element names and symbols. I'm going to show you a few that can be kind of tricky and hopefully I can give you a little information that will help you remember uh, where their symbols are coming from and why they don't match the current modern name for some of these elements. Okay, so start with some flashcards to learn element names and symbols as you're learning them. Learn all the ones on the handout. Every time you see a new element in lecture, in your homework, okay, in your reading, I now have assigned you to learn that symbol and name. And yes, spelling counts. You need to learn how to spell the element names correctly. Okay, So you're going to be learning all these as we go along. So everything on this slide, all these elements, I want you to learn their names and symbols. Okay, so here's some tricky to memorize uh, element symbols. First of all, let's look at gold. Gold symbol is a capital A lowercase u. Now a lot of times once we start to see symbols for elements that don't seem to relate directly to the current modern name, that's usually because they're coming from uh, other languages, usually uh, Greek and Latin names, okay, where these were originating from. And then those names usually refer to where we found the elements, the properties of those elements, uh, with respect to what they look like or what they were used for. So they relate to the elements with respect to how they first understood them or maybe observed them or where they found them. Okay, that's what they saw first. So if we look at a capital A lowercase u, okay, that really referred to the ancient uh, goddess of dawn, okay, Aurora. Okay, so we were seeing that with respect to gold because of the shiny color of gold you can imagine is kind of like the color of uh, a dawn in the morning. Okay, so it's a little bit like that. That's where that name originated from. That's kind of hard to remember. That's a lot to remember even though I have a nice word history of these names and etymology of where all the names of the elements have come from and where those useful handouts on Blackboard. Uh, I'm going to give you a little mnemonic device to help you remember gold that might make it easier. Uh, so if you're trying to remember the, where the symbol for gold comes from, sometimes it helps to produce a little uh, story to help you remember these. Okay. So let's say you're thinking back to really old-fashioned mobsters that might be chasing you and you have some gold they want. What might they say to you? And how would this re help you remember the name for gold? Well, if they're chasing you and you've got that gold, perhaps an old-fashioned mobster might say something like, Hey you, give me your gold. So you remember that AU, right? Okay, so a capital A, lowercase u. Okay, there's your symbol for gold. So if you can come up with a little story to help you remember these, it'll be very helpful. Okay, let's look at lead. The symbol for lead is a capital P, lowercase b. Okay, that's the old name plumbus, which was the old-fashioned name for uh, lead itself. Okay, but it's also where we originated with the term plumber because old originally plumbing was made. Ancient plumbing was made from lead. Okay, for example, the ancient Romans, when they had indoor plumbing, if they were the very wealthy, they would have lead pipes that were used. That was partially because lead has a low melting point, so it was easy for them to work with. Uh, they also didn't fully, completely understand the toxicity of lead, okay, with lead toxicity and how that influenced with uh, brain development and so on. And so uh, they didn't realize the dangers of it. In fact, the ancient Romans, they put lead in uh, lead salts lead ionic compounds, lead salts into their wine. Uh, as present, I believe I've read in some beauty products. Okay, they were using lead all over the place at the time period. They thought it made things taste better. Uh, unfortunately, it was toxic as well. Uh, but they had it in their plumbing. So you can imagine if you were very wealthy at the time period, you could end up with lead poisoning. It would affect your mental development. Um, but however, if you think about how the... Um, the emperors and their families at the time period tend to have a lot of inbreeding. They probably had some other issues too with their mental development, so maybe they didn't notice so much. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, there's lead poisoning that could have occurred. Uh, with respect to lead, if you're trying to remember the symbol PB, uh, I've had students tell me they can remember that by thinking, I definitely don't want lead in my peanut butter, right? So PB. So whatever helps you remember a little cute story, that's going to be great. Uh, if we look at sodium, the old-fashioned name for sodium was natrium. Okay, remember coming from like Latin and Greek names. Uh, natrium referred to soda and some types of sodium containing ionic compounds that could be like headache remedies and so on. And so uh, it's just was the term soda was natrium. Okay, and so we use capital N lowercase a. If we look at mercury, 
Well, uh, the capital H lowercase g refers back to the old-fashioned name for Quicksilver, which was the old name for Mercury. Okay. If we look at iron, capital F lowercase e for ferrum, which meant firmness, right? Because of the the firm, strong nature of iron type of uh, mat containing materials. If we look at silver, capital A, lowercase g. If we look at tin, the old-fashioned name was stannous, capital S, lowercase n. Uh, potassium, the capital letter K is used for that. That refers back to the old-fashioned name callium. And that's because callium uh, referred to uh, alkaline or basic. That's because originally they would collect uh, potassium hydroxide from ashes. So ashes would produce uh, basically basic characteristics in those ashes, uh, which means alkaline as well. Basic and alkaline, we're using that interchangeably. And they produce like potassium hydroxide, which is a strong base, KOH, potassium hydroxide. And so calcium meant basic, in a sense, alkaline. And that came from the ashes where they collect the potassium hydroxide. Okay, so it was referred to one of its uses. We'll learn later in the course that they can use ashes and fats from, like animal fats that could be involved in cooking and the ashes from the cooking fire, uh, could produce a reaction with the base reacting with the fats, a saphonification reaction is what we call that. Saphonification is the production of soap from fat. Okay, so that's kind of where that originates from. So we'll see that later in the course. So again, potassium was important in that process with callium, the basic nature of it. Okay, so try to learn these. They're a little bit tricky, okay? I want you to notice sodium symbol is a capital N, lowercase a. What is the capital S used for as an element name? It's not sodium. Be sulfur, right? Sulfur. Okay, so let's look at a few element symbols and see how many of the others you probably already know the symbols for. And yes, you need to be able to spell names correctly too when you're writing these down. If I see a capital C, what element does that stand for? I bet you already know. What element is that? That's carbon, right? Very important with respect to the structures of your body. You have carbon in your biological molecules, right? In your proteins. In your uh, different structures of your body, you have carbon present that's used in the carbohydrates you digest, right? So it's present in all these biological molecules. So very important. Okay, it's in our fuels in our society. Very important. Capital O, what element is that? It's oxygen, isn't it? I bet you knew it was oxygen already. If I see a capital C again, I might confuse it with carbon. So we put a second letter for some element symbol. So here's a capital C, lowercase a. Please note I'm using lowercase for the second element symbol. Do not capitalize it. I'll try to convince you why it's important not to capitalize the second letter here in a second. So a capital C, lowercase a, what element is that? That's calcium, isn't it? That's calcium. If I have a capital C, lowercase l, that would be what element? That's chlorine. Chlorine. Okay, that's on the right-hand side of the periodic table next to argon. Okay. If I have a capital C again, I don't want to confuse these with carbon, so I'm using a second letter, but they're always lowercase for the second letter. A lowercase u. Hmm, what would that be? This one's a little trickier. This is actually for copper. Okay, but it goes back to old-fashioned naming cuprous, okay, uh, with respect to copper. Uh, that really goes back to the name of an island where they used to mine copper in ancient times. Okay, that's where that originates from. I want you to notice, though, copper is a capital C, lowercase u. Don't confuse it with the net symbol, capital C, lowercase o, not copper. What is this element? This is cobalt. Don't confuse copper symbol with cobalt symbol. Be very careful. Now, if I have a capital C, lowercase r, what element is that? It's a metal. There's a hint. It's a metal. It's kind of in the middle of the periodic table. It's chromium. Chromium. If I have a capital B, what element would that be? You might not be as familiar with this one. That's boron. Boron. I have a capital B, lowercase a, that's barium. So we use a second letter for a number of elements, especially when it would cause confusion if I just use the same first letter. And we always have a lowercase 
letter for the second letter, not capitalized. Let's see why that would be confusing. Let's go back and look at cobalt. If I had forgotten as a student and written it as a capital C, capital O, that's really not a good thing. And you're going to get that marked off on a test if you did that when you meant cobalt. Let's see why. If I had capitalized both letters, let's say I'd written it like this, that has a completely different meaning, doesn't it? That would be the uh, molecular formula for a molecule that's carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. Have you ever heard of carbon monoxide poisoning when you're burning fuels and you don't have enough oxygen mixing with the fuel? You get some incomplete combustion when not enough oxygen mixing with that carbon-based fuel. And you get carbon monoxide that can be emitted. So you should have a carbon monoxide sensor in your home uh, if you're worried about that perhaps occurring. And it's recommended you have that if you're burning natural gas or wood burning stove, uh, anything that's going to be burning carbon-based uh, fuels, hydrocarbons is what we call those. And um, that's because carbon monoxide binds fairly strongly to the iron in your hemoglobin. Okay, And the iron in your hemoglobin transports oxygen from your lungs to your cells for respiration processes where it combines with uh, sugars and carbohydrates, for example, uh, to produce energy. This can be stored in ATP and so on. Uh, don't worry too much about that. A little bit of biology reactions there. But then you also produce side products of carbon dioxide, which your hemoglobin can bind to weakly and transport back to your lungs where it releases it and you exhale it. Now the oxygen and carbon dioxide that's transported in your blood with the hemoglobin uh, needs to be bound so much weakly so you can release it at the other site. But carbon monoxide binds much more strongly to the iron and hemoglobin than carbon dioxide. So the carbon monoxide will bind to that hemoglobin and not allow the iron to function properly. The initial uh, indication you might have minor carbon monoxide poisoning is you tend to feel tired because you're not transporting oxygen effectively. You're not getting all the energy uh, from your cells, from cellular respiration very effectively. So that's kind of what that's indicating. Uh, too much carbon monoxide though can end up basically asphyxiating you because your red blood cells can't transport oxygen to your cells or to your brain for example and so you die. Okay, so and, and that's happened to people in, in Idaho that's been in the news in the last year or two. You've seen that probably in newspapers. Okay, but do you see the difference? Carbon monoxide with, when they're capitalized letters versus cobalt when the O is lowercase. So capitalization is very important. Here's another example of that. Let's look at this. If I have all these letters capitalized, they have a very different meaning than when I have some of them lowercase. If these are all capitalized, I'm thinking this first capital C is carbon atoms. The capital O would be oxygen atoms. A capital C again, that would be carbon atoms again. If I have capital L, well, that's not a symbol for an element, but in inorganic chemistry, the chemistry of metals, uh, that indicates what we call a ligand. Now, a ligand is a molecule or an ion that basically forms what we call a coordination bond. It's attracting strongly, forming this type of bond to a metal that's present out there. Okay, so these are called ligands. So that's kind of a placeholder for a variety of molecules or ions that can do that. Okay, you'll learn more about some of the terminology I'm using here as you continue on the course, so don't worry if it didn't all make sense. Just remember here that a capital L has a very specific meaning. Okay, if I use a capital B, I'm thinking boron. A capital R is a placeholder in organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is the chemistry of molecules that basically contain carbon and some other elements. Okay, uh, So R is basically a part of a molecule. It's a placeholder, a part of a molecule that can have a different number of carbons and other atoms present, like hydrogen. Okay, So it's a placeholder for a type of branch of chemistry. Uh, so those have very specific meanings. Now let's see what happens if we had lowercase for some of these letters. So if I have a capital C, lowercase o, that's cobalt. If I have a capital C, lowercase l, well, that's chlorine. If I have a capital B, lowercase r, that's bromine. The meaning changes entirely when you have capitalized letters versus lowercase letters. So it is important you have your capitalization written correctly. So be cautious there. Okay, the next thing I'm going to be talking about is the development of the modern theory of the atom. And that leads through a little bit of history here. So we already talked about Democritus. So if we consider Democritus, well, we attribute the, uh, basically the name Atomo, or Atomos, right, indivisible Atomos, to atoms that we call them now. But he didn't have experimental evidence. Now what happened is we start to get to the uh, 1700s and 1800s, so we start to collect more uh, 
chemistry experiments that have data that refers to chemical reactions where we have uh, some experimental evidence that there's whole number ratios of small particles combining and rearranging in chemical reactions. And we really thank John um, Dalton to using this these ideas. Now until John Dalton though, Democritus' ideas were kind of dismissed of the atom. Aristotle, his ideas of the elements out there being earth, water, air, fire, and ether, he thought that you'd have all these different elements combining to form all the matter around us. He thought if you combine earth with water, you got mud, right? And you could explain all of these by mixing them. Uh, very much simplified from the modern idea of elements. And But Aristotle was very famous at the time period. People accepted his ideas, even over those of Democritus, and it held for over 2,000 years. But it was in the early 1800s that uh, John Dalton, who was an English schoolmaster, he kind of came back to this idea of these small, indivisible particles. We know better today there are parts to these particles, these atoms, called subatomic particles, but they didn't have any evidence for that yet. Okay, so John Dalton's atomic theory uh, doesn't involve subatomic particles. We'll be adding that to the modern theory as we go along. Uh, so, John Dalton's Atomic Theory was published in 1808, and we really consider him, in a sense, a father to the modern theory of atomic, uh, atomic theory because of atoms, because he helps kind of lead us down the correct road. Now, he didn't do all the experiments, he didn't collect all the data himself, but he was able to look at this data that was collected from other chemists and kind of put it together into his atomic theory. So, he was standing on the shoulders of other uh, giants in science, okay, at the time period. Now I want to ask you though today, do we have some advantages over Democritus? Do we have some advantage over John Dalton? Sure, we have instruments they didn't have. Obviously Democritus didn't have any uh, advanced scientific instruments and John Dalton's uh, experiments he was looking at were dealing with very simple apparatuses compared to some of the things we have today. We are very lucky because today we have instruments that can help us visualize individual small molecules or individual atoms. They didn't have that at the time period, so we have some evidence here to look at. We're going to look at some uh, electron microscope images. These are actually scanning tunneling uh, microscope images. Now when they design these types of microscopes, they can't use light. These are not light microscopes. Light microscopes cannot visualize individual um, molecules or atoms. They can see uh, cells and small microorganisms, but those are much larger than individual atoms or small molecules. Here's the problem with a light microscope. The light microscope deals with visible light, and visible light is hundreds of nanometers in wavelength, which is much larger than the size of the individual atoms or molecules you might want to resolve to see. Okay, so light microscopes cannot see that small because the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation of the light you're using is much too large. However, if we use an electron beam, the wavelength of an electron beam is small enough we can start to visualize individual atoms or molecules. Now for the longest time people thought you wouldn't be able to visualize uh, under this type of instrument individual molecules or atoms because there'd just be too many vibrations just from thermal energy, the heat in the room, or from uh, vibrations of people moving around and so on. There's just too many vibrations from all the uh, energy that the sample would have in order to visualize it. That's what people thought at first. But they actually were very successful, but they had to use a few techniques in order to visualize individual molecules and atoms with a tunneling microscope, for example they would have a filament that they would apply a high voltage to which basically caused the filament to start bleeding off electrons. So they produced a beam of electrons which they could accelerate uh, with voltages applied to plates in the, in the tunneling microscope. Uh, however, they didn't want to have the electrons running into atoms or molecules as it was going to move and bombard a sample. Just a second, sorry. What, so they have it under vacuum. They've removed the um, 
the molecules like oxygen and nitrogen that are in the air as well as atoms that are in the air they removed most of the molecules from it they evacuated produce a vacuum inside the instrument you have that electron beam then that is is bombarding your sample without running into all of those other particles we also didn't want the gases inside the chamber to be striking your sample because that would cause it to move and then you wouldn't be able to visualize uh, such small things as atoms and molecules small molecules and so they would have basically uh, it under vacuum, a high vacuum, and then you'd also cool it down because we don't want a lot of thermal motion. So they bring the temperature down so it's a very cold sample. And they would use usually solids. So solids work best here. Liquids have too much motion in them. And under vacuum, the liquids would tend to uh, basically go to the gas phase. We would have evaporation of liquids and that would cause uh, your vacuum to be ruined. You'd have the electron beam running into um, your molecules in the gas phase from your sample. And as well as the samples has motion in it so you couldn't visualize things. So solids work the best here. Uh, but if we do have a solid, low temperature, under vacuum with the electron beam striking it, we can start to visualize with a tunneling microscope or an electron microscope individual atoms or molecules. So here we have a 5 nanometer wide pitcher. Now to get an idea of a nanometer, a nanometer is going to be a billionth of a meter. So this is 5 billionths of a meter wide. And what we're seeing here is that each one of these bright spots is the top. These are spherical atoms of gold, right? AU for the symbol for gold. So here we have gold atoms in nice lined up rows in this sample. So we're seeing individual atoms here. I've been lucky enough with my research that I've been able to use tunneling microscopes. And that's just amazing because you can take, go to the lab. You can synthesize this molecule. Organize the atoms into the shape you want in the molecule from the chemical reactions you're performing. Then you can go ahead and if you're lucky enough, you can reserve time, usually at a government lab, uh, to use one of these very expensive telling microscopes. It can often be hundreds of thousands of dollars or up close to a million dollars depending on the instrument. And once you get to use these, you can go ahead and see your molecules and the atoms in your molecules arranged the way you intended. That's really amazing. That's really amazing. Now I want to make sure you have an idea just how small atoms are. So I said that a nanometer was a billionth of a meter. Well atoms are a tenth of a nanometer roughly in size. So about 0.1 to 0.2 nanometers. So that means they're about a tenth of a billionth of a meter. Okay. So they're very small. Now, if I want to use scientific notation to write a billionth of a meter, it's written as 1.0 times 10 to the negative ninth. This may be the first course you've been introduced to scientific notation in. When I write my scientific, no scientific notation times 10 to the negative ninth, a negative number in this exponent means the original number was very small, like my billionth of the meter. Uh, if it's a negative 9, that means the decimal point has been moved to the right 9 times. To take it back to a standard number out of scientific notation, we move the decimal point over to the left 9 times. Okay, so if I do that, I end up with 0 0.00000001 meters. That's a billionth of a meter or a nanometer. Okay, so I converted that to a meter by moving that decimal point. So one nanometer is one billionth of a meter. As a standard number, you could write it this way. That's a lot of zeros to write. You might forget one of the zeros, and it's just kind of tedious to keep writing that down. So if you move the decimal point over nine times till it's after the one, we get 1 1.0 times 10. I showed the exponent indicating how many times I moved the decimal point. Okay, I moved it nine times. It's a negative telling me I had moved it to the right nine times to generate this number. It was a very small number to begin with. Okay, so that's what we have for the size of a nanometer. The individual atoms are going to be uh, 0.1 to 0.2 nanometers wide. Let's compare that to a human hair. A human hair is about, depending on the coarseness of the hair, about 80,000 nanometers wide. So it's huge compared to one atom. Now, if we were to look at the structure of the human hair, there's proteins in there that are forming long chains that have then formed uh, alpha helices and uh, pl pleated sheets, okay, with it. But if I just think about it more simply, let's imagine that thickness of the human hair. What if they had atoms lined up in a nice neat row, side by side, even though that's not how the pr atoms and the proteins are organized in the hair? If I have these atoms side by side, how many atoms side by side that are about 0.1 to 0.2 nanometers would I have to use to add up to the thickness of that hair that's 80,000 nanometers wide? 
Now please note, the atoms are smaller than a single nanometer, so it takes several of them to add up to a, a nanometer. Okay, so it takes more than 80,000, right? Since they're about a tenth to two tenths of a nanometer, we're looking at 400 to 800 thousand roughly so somewhere between 400,000 to 800,000 nanometer or atoms side by side to add up to the thickness of a human hair to that 80,000 nanometers okay they're all 0.1 it's going to take 10 times as many so 80,000 atoms side by side okay so that just tells you how small these atoms are they're very tiny okay now let's consider with respect to the number of are the size of atoms, how big are some biological types of things? Let's consider a red blood cell. A red blood cell is going to be 10,000 times larger than an atom. An atom is 10,000 times smaller than a human red blood cell. Okay? This is why we start to look at some of these microorganisms and cells under light microscopes, but I don't have a chance to see a single atom under a light microscope. I had to use my tunneling microscope. Okay? So really very interesting with how tiny they are. Now I want to ask you this. Why is nanotechnology exciting to a lot of scientists? Well, if you go back to uh, the 1990s, well, nanotechnology was a big buzzword that scientists would use in their funding proposals uh, to various government organizations to try to get money. And with respect to that nanotechnology, it was such an interesting word to use because it indicated you're working on the cutting edge at the time period. Uh, uh, very small technologies that involved atoms or small molecules, so it was very popular to use. Anymore, that's not really such an important buzzword to use because really all cutting-edge technology out there anymore is using nanotechnology. It's not just some of them. Okay, We're, We've moved way beyond uh, micrometers with respect to microchips. We're, we've we're moving beyond that, and we're approaching the, these nanometer scale as rapidly with technology as we can, and we can find very useful uh, types of technologies out there that will be better than what we currently have with nanotechnology. I'd like to argue that uh, chemists have been using nanotechnology for hundreds of years, in that we've been running chemical reactions that rearrange atoms to make new molecules for a long time. So chemists have been using nanotechnology for a long time, uh, but we weren't really manipulating one atom or one molecule at a time. We had large quantities of them. We just learned how to use the large quantities and control how they would rearrange or recombine on the once we had a large number of these molecules or atoms. Uh, but yeah, very interesting, very exciting types of research, but it's a lot of the research out there. The next thing I want to talk about is the law of conservation of mass. So the law of conservation of mass basically states that matter can neither be created nor destroyed by chemical means. So if I have a chemical reaction, I'm not going to create or destroy matter. Uh, that means basically that the mass of my reactants I begin with in a chemical reaction will be identical to the mass of the products what I end up with after the chemical reaction, even after the atoms have recombined to form new substances. That's because in a chemical reaction I haven't destroyed or created any atoms. I have the same number of atoms I begin with. The same types of atoms I began with at the beginning of the reaction are still there at the end of the reaction. They may have rearranged and formed new chemical bonds with one another, but they're still there. We didn't destroy or create any of them. On the scales in our lab, we won't see any mass changes in, the, in your laboratory scales from the beginning of the reaction to the end of the reaction, unless maybe you produce the gas and you lost some of the gas. If I were to go collect that gas and weigh the mass of gas produced as well, though, I would find, yes, that was the extra mass, and I have the same mass before and after the reaction with respect to the scales we're using. If you talk to a physicist, they might say there's really, really itsy bitsy tiny changes in mass as we convert some energy to mass or mass to energy, uh, but it's such tiny amounts that you can ignore it, in your chem lab, you're going to say that you have conservation of mass. Really easy to predict things that way, and that's really a true statement with the scales that you're going to be using. Okay, What's really maybe a better definition here, though, is just to say you have the exact same number of atoms before and after. Okay, They've been rearranged into new substances, potentially, but you have the same number of atoms of the same elements that we began with. Okay, We didn't change the number of atoms of any of the elements we began with. They're still there. So chemistry is really a study of how compounds and elements behave as they go through chemical reactions and how existing atoms are rearranged within and between compounds during a chemical process. But I have the same number of atoms at the end as I started with. Okay, If I collect them all and, and, and weigh them, I'd see I have the same mass. Okay.
So if we're saying the total mass has not changed during a chemical reaction, well then let's use some examples of reactions to look at this. Okay, so the law of conservation of mass. We're going to look at some examples of it. Now I know you haven't learned how to write chemical reactions yet, so I'm going to kind of help you along here. So let's write them out with words to begin with. I'm going to look at natural gas burning in the oxygen atmosphere. Okay, so I'm going to look at methane gas burning with oxygen from our atmosphere. So natural gas is main component is methane. There's also some ethane in there and maybe a little propane in there, but methane is the main component. It's going to react with oxygen gas. And if there's plenty of oxygen gas to react with that methane, this fuel. So as I'm combining oxygen with my fuel, as I combine oxygen with other elements, we call that a combustion reaction. So oxygen is combining with the elements in methane, which is carbon and, and hydrogen. We call methane a hydrocarbon fuel because carbon and hydrogen are present. We'll end up producing two products if there's plenty of oxygen. We call this a complete combustion reaction when there's uh, sufficient oxygen for all of the elements to combine. Uh, we end up with carbon dioxide, so carbon combined with two oxygens. We also end up with water. You may remember that water's formula is H2O, two hydrogens with an oxygen atom. Okay, so there's my reactants in yellow, the starting material that I have, forming products in green. Okay, if I write the formulas for my reactants, the methane and the oxygen gas over here, this is how I would write my chemical formulas. I write the element symbols down. This is why you have to learn all the element symbols to start writing chemical reactions. And then I write a subscript number to indicate the numbers of atoms of that element in the molecular compound. If I don't show a number after the element symbol, it indicates I only have one. So chemists are a little bit lazy. They just say, okay, we're all going to agree if I don't write a number, it's a one. Okay. So there's one carbon atom in, in the methane formula. Then there's elemental hydro or there's hydrogen present, right? Atoms of hydrogen. I show a subscript four. So there's four hydrogen atoms and one carbon atom in a methane molecule. If I look at my diatomic oxygen gas here. I say it's diatomic because oxygen in nature exists in packets of two. Two oxygen atoms will be bound to one another to be more stable than a single oxygen atom out there. So whenever I talk about oxygen from the atmosphere, we're going to say O2, right? It's the most stable form of oxygen. It's more stable than single oxygen atoms floating around. They'd rather be bound together to one another with a covalent bond, a chemical bond. Okay. I, the coefficient in front of the O2 is a 2. That means I have two of these molecules, even if the molecule has multiple atoms in it. Okay, The 2 here indicates two oxygen atoms and that subscript are co bonded covalently to one another, but then I have two of these little groups of two oxygen atoms, two diatomic molecules. That's what this coefficient 2 tells me. Then as it reacts, I form carbon dioxide. So there's one carbon atom and carbon dioxide and two oxygen atoms in carbon dioxide. Plus, I have two water molecules. So there's two of these molecules, the coefficient tells me so. Each one of the water molecules has two hydrogen atoms. There's no number shown after oxygen, so we assume it's a 1. So there's one oxygen atom, H2O. Now here, this is why this is important. Did we conserve mass? Did we conserve the number of atoms in our reactants, the methane burning with the oxygen, compared to the products, the carbon dioxide forming and the water molecules forming? Let's count them up. I started with one carbon atom. I ended up with one carbon atom. I started with four hydrogen atoms. Did I end up with four hydrogen atoms? Sure, there's two per water molecule, but I have two of the water molecules. So I have H2O plus H2O is one way of thinking about it because there's two of them. Okay, It's kind of like writing a two in front of the word bicycle. You're knowing the bicycle has two tires, just like a water molecule has two hydrogens, but I have two of them. If I have two bicycles, I have four tires. If I have two water molecules, I have four hydrogens. Okay, So I have the same number of hydrogens on both sides. So I conserve the number of atoms. If I look at my oxygens, where there's two per molecule, but I have two of those molecules, so I have four oxygen atoms to begin with. Now here I have to be careful because the oxygen is present in both products, so I have to think about both. So I have two oxygen atoms in the carbon dioxide, plus I have one oxygen in a water molecule, but I have two water molecules. So you see you still have four oxygen atoms in the product, so we conserve mass, we conserve the number of atoms. I can add up kind of an element inventory to keep track of the number of element atoms of each type in my reactants and the number of element atoms in my products of each type. And I see I have one carbon on both sides, four hydrogens on both sides, and four oxygens on each side if I count them up. I conserve mass, conserve number of atoms. Okay.
Now let's consider conserving mass again. Let's say we weighed the amount of my reactants in grams. So I have my methane reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water, and let's weigh it out in grams. I begin with 100 grams of methane and 399 grams of oxygen, and I use them both up entirely. There's nothing extra, nothing in excess. They both reacted completely. That often won't happen, but here we had everything in perfect ratios, so they react completely. And we ended up measuring that 274 grams of carbon dioxide were formed. Okay. Now I need to know how many grams of water was formed. The law of conservation of mass tells me I should have the same mass of products as I had reactants. So let's add up the mass of the reactants. I had 100 grams of methane and 399 grams of oxygen. That's going to be 499 grams of reactants. If everything goes to make products, I should also have 499 grams of products. So I have 274 grams of one product, and I can figure out how many grams of the other product I would have. Okay, so Try to figure this out. You figure out how many grams of the water should have been collected from your knowledge of conservation of mass. Okay, now I want you to write down how much product water in grams should have been produced on your piece of paper. And then I want you to show it to a neighbor and see if they have the same answer. See if they're coming up with the same mass in grams of water as well. Okay. Are you getting the same answer? Okay, which one of these is the right answer? Okay, let's look at it. We started with 499 grams. We know that 274 grams of carbon dioxide plus however many grams of water I had should also add up to 499 grams. So if I take 499 grams and subtract 274, you should have found that you had 225 grams of water that would have taking care of the additional mass. So we conserve mass on both sides. We have the same number of atoms on both sides, just much larger quantities since we're dealing with gram quantities. Okay. Now to help you visualize this, let's go ahead and look at um, a reaction that we have some pictures for. So here's an old-fashioned triple beam balance. where We have some glassware, we have some reactants dissolved in water, Okay, and we balance out their mass on this triple beam balance with some uh, metal weights on the other side so that we've balanced everything perfectly. Then we're going to run a reaction and see if it's still balanced on each side. So here we have sodium chromate. It's an ionic compound. I've written the formulas. I wouldn't expect you to be able to predict these formulas yet, but soon after chapter 3. So start learning your ion formulas on your handouts. Okay. Then we have lead to nitrate. We're going to react these two. In brackets, we see an AQ after each of these substances. That means aqueous. They're in a water-based solution. Water-based solution is what that's telling me. I form a product. One of the products is still dissolved in water. My phase label tells me down here. The other phase label in brackets is a lowercase s, which indicates a solid. A solid. So I'm producing a solid in my water-based solutions as I mix these. This is called a precipitation reaction. When I mix two different salts, two different ionic compounds, and they were dissolved in soluble to begin with, and I form a solid that's insoluble, we call that a precipitation reaction. It forms a precipitate. Now, what I formed was lead to chromate. It forms a beautiful canary yellow solid, okay? And you'll be seeing this in the course later on. But I get the lead to chromate, really beautiful. Uh, it ends up precipitating out as that yellow precipitate. We can see that forming here as the solid particles are coming out of solution and collecting on the bottom of my Erlenmeyer flask, okay? I mixed all the solution that had been in my graduated cylinder when I ran this reaction. I want you to notice it's still perfectly balanced. Okay, all my products were either in solution or solid, and my my reactants were in solution. My products are in solution or a solid, so I didn't have anything escaped to the gas phase. So it was really easy to see that I'm mass balanced. So there's a law of conservation of mass for a chemical reaction. You can see it with your eyes. Let's try just a couple of other reactions. Let's consider if I have these models of chemical reactions and the molecules involved. These are called space filling models where we show spheres of different colors to indicate the atoms of different elements. And we just decided, human beings decided, let's go ahead and use white for hydrogen and red for oxygen. This is nothing that you can see, right? Because light doesn't interact with these individual atoms or small molecules. So we just pick the colors. We should, let's just use red for oxygen. Let's use white for hydrogen. Okay.
So do we have the law of conservation of mass occurring here when we take oxygen gas and react it with hydrogen gas? This is a combustion reaction. Oxygen is combining with another element. It's combining with hydrogen. So the combustion of hydrogen with oxygen gas produces water vapor. So I get water molecules. Is the law of conservation of mass followed here? How would you know? Well, if I knew the um, mass quantities, I could add those up on both sides and see. But it's even simpler when I have a diagram like this with the space-filling models. I can count numbers of atoms. If I have the law of conservation of mass, the number of atoms I began with should be equal to the number of atoms of each type that I end up with. Do I have the law of conservation of mass occurring here? I'm hoping you all said yes, because if I count the number of hydrogen atoms I began with, I have two diatomic hydrogen molecules. So I have one, two, three, four hydrogen atoms I begin with. I end up with, in my products, water molecules. But there's one, two, three, four hydrogen atoms. So I have the same number of hydrogens on both sides. I started with a diatomic oxygen molecule. So there's two oxygen atoms. I have two water molecules, one oxygen in each. So I still have two oxygen atoms. So I have conserved the number of atoms on both sides of this chemical reaction, as shown with these space-filling models. So the law of conservation of mass is consistent there. You're going to have some homework questions similar to this, so make sure you can do these. OK, so if we go ahead and look at this chemical reaction, here I have hydrogen gas, which is diatomic. This is diatomic elemental molecules reacting with nitrogen gas. We end up forming ammoni ammonia molecules, so it's a nitrogen and three hydrogen each. Do we have the law of conservation of mass occurring here? I'm hoping you said that the law of conservation of mass is not maintained in these space-filling diagrams in these pictures. How do I know? Let's count the number of nitrogen atoms. I have two nitrogen atoms here in the reactant side with the diatomic elemental nitrogen gas, like in our atmosphere. I ended up with two nitrogen atoms and the two ammonia molecules. So nitrogen was conserved. However, if I look at hydrogen, I started with one, two, three, four hydrogen atoms. My products, however, have one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogen atoms. I have too many hydrogen atoms shown in the products, so I didn't conserve mass. I can't have hydrogen atoms just created. They must have come from somewhere. So I did not maintain the law of conservation of mass here. So this is not a balanced chemical process. It doesn't show the whole picture. It can't. I can't produce hydrogen atoms out of nowhere, out of thin air. It must have come from somewhere. I must have another diatomic hydrogen molecule that probably would have been present to begin with. So I should have shown three on the reactant side to conserve mass. I should have had six hydrogen atoms on both sides. So this one did not fall the law of conservation of mass. This is where we're going to end today. I will look at the law of definite proportions and the law of definite compositions in our next discussion. Uh, we will also look at uh, Dalton's atomic theory in greater detail and the postulates involved. And then we'll start to look at the modern atomic theory and subatomic particles next time, Okay, and how to write atomic symbols counting subatomic particles present on the periodic table. Okay, so that's what we'll look at next time. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Take care.